Good day, Roger. Thank you for agreeing to do this interview with me. We're doing this over Skype for everybody who's watching. Let me give a little background about you uh, for our audience. You are Professor Emeritus from Florida State University. You served as Distinguished Research Professor at the Sonora Institute of Technology, Mexico, and we'll talk a little bit about that uh, later on in this interview. You received ATD's Distinguished Contribution to Workplace Learning and Performance Award. For ISPI, the International Society for Performance Improvement, you're a past president, honorary member for life, and a recipient of the Thomas Gilbert Award. You've published 41 books, and we'll talk about a couple of those, but not all of them. Uh, you've published over 300 articles on strategic planning, performance improvement, quality management, and continual improvement, needs assessment, management, and evaluation. You consult worldwide with public, private, and NGO organizations, the most recent of which include the President and Minister of Tourism of Panama. You've also consulted with the University of Puerto Rico, the Civil Service Commissions of Taiwan, and the, I'm not going to be able to pronounce this, the C. Chain Foundation of Science and Technology, as well as the Korean government. Sorry if I've mangled that. Uh, at Flor I, could, I, I couldn't have done it better. <laughs> at Florida State, you created the Center for Needs Assessment and Planning and did applied research and development there. The literature often cites you as the father of needs assessment. The International Society for Performance Improvement has created the Roger Kaufman Award for Societal Impact. This award recognizes continuous achievement of measurable positive societal impact by an individual or an organization. You are a fellow of the American Psychological Association as well as of the American Educational Research Association. Roger, I know we've caught you in uh, pollen season down in Florida. And so uh, uh, please, if you feel the need to take a drink, et cetera, please go ahead and do so. But Thank you. I'd like to start this interview with going way, way, way back in the time machine here. And can you tell us a little bit about where you grew up and uh, some of your uh, early schooling? What's your background? Well, I was born at a very early age. Uh, my uh, mother was from New Haven, Connecticut. My father was from Boston. Uh, he set up a, a radio uh, manufacturing business called LK Radio in New Haven, and that was before Super Heterodyne receivers. Um, the, uh, they moved to uh, Washington, D.C. at the height of the Depression, and, uh, and there I was born. Mm -hmm. uh, I grew up in, uh, in one house at, on Everett Street which not even taxi drivers can find anymore. And uh, the uh, had to fight my way to and from uh, junior high school because the crowd uh, there thought I was a Christ killer. And that was not fun, but uh, I learned something about uh, dealing with the adversity, prejudice, and hate. Uh, the, uh, I uh, was unfortunate enough. Well, I went to uh, Purdue University for my uh, first year. Uh, came home and uh, married what was soon to be my uh, ex-wife, mm -hmm. and uh, and uh, uh, was uh, went uh, had gone to uh, after uh, graduating high school went to Johns Hopkins got a uh, master's of arts degree in psychology industrial psychology mostly mm -hmm. and industrial engineering uh, went on to UC Berkeley uh, and. Uh, really met some very interesting people like Tolman and was in the middle of the fight between the behaviorists and the gestaltists and didn't realize what a gift uh, these professors and fellow students were giving. Uh, one of the gifts that I got, uh, which I came to appreciate later, <clears throat> was one of our fellow graduate students was uh, Daniel Kahneman, who won the Nobel Prize for uh, Applied Economics. And they lied to us there a lot. They said that everybody there had an IQ of over 140. And it was obvious to all that Danny was so much smarter than the rest of it. Uh, it, it he, was, he was really brilliant. Um, from there, I went to work at uh, uh, Boeing. Uh, I was a one-man uh, human factors uh, team on the Beaumark missile. And uh, then I moved back uh, to Martin Baltimore, uh, 
in uh, obviously Baltimore. Uh, there accepted uh, a, a job at U.S. Industries, and I thought I was moving to Santa Barbara, California. I wanted to get back there. And they said, when I came to their Silver Spring office to say, uh, okay, let's arrange the moving arrangements, said, oh, by the way, we've moved the headquarters to New York City. And my uh, apologies to all New Yorkers. Uh, I didn't want to live in New York City, but I'd already quit my job at, uh, at, my, at Martin Baltimore and started uh, uh, working for them in New York. Uh, they got a... Uh, Got a divorce, uh, met uh, the love of my life, Jan. Uh, her name was Janice Karen, and uh, uh, we ultimately got married, and she's the best thing that ever could have happened to me. Uh, the old uh, song says she's the wind under my wing. There you go. Uh, while, I, while I was there, uh, I was asked one night to uh, come down and talk about teaching machines and program instruction to Irene Cipher's class in uh, New York University. I went there, and after half an hour, she said, well, would you excuse me? Well, uh, and I said, of course, it's her class. And she came back with another class, uh, A.J. Foy Cross, uh, and um, uh, we, uh, instead of going the hour and a half, we went about four. And the next day, I got a call from uh, uh, Professor Cross, and he said, uh, we've looked into your background. You never finished your doctorate at, uh, at Berkeley. Uh, we'd like to... Uh, invite you to come and finish it at NYU. And with that kind of support, that was fantastic. So, so I did. I learned a lot. Uh, I got some very, very good mentoring from, a, uh, uh, from some good people uh, and um, the, got my degree, uh, moved immediately afterwards uh, to work at um, Bolt Baranica Newman. Uh, at that time, they had a little project with the ARPA, Advanced Research Project Agency, which was the internet. And by the way, we never heard of Al Gore at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, but uh, these were, it's always nice to work with people who are smarter than you are. And these people are really smart. Uh, I got, uh, made, got my degree, got married, uh, accepted a job at Douglas Aircraft, and then Kennedy got it executed. And everything stopped. And Bolt Baranica Newman, I'll love them forever, said, hey, stay with us until things sort out. And I did. And I was very appreciative of that. Went to work at uh, Douglas Aircraft, uh, ultimately uh, the Human Factors Group. And then um, the, uh, the Vice President for Engineering asked me to be his assistant. And it was nice to be on Mahogany Row and watch the airplanes take off and land. And uh, from there... Uh, Bob Corgan and I had started some work and got an experienced teacher fellowship, which is then Chapman College, now Chapman University, uh, to uh, teach uh, uh, strategic and operational planning to uh, the, uh, the heads of planning for all the uh, county office, offices in California. And that's when I started developing, uh, you know, this thing called, uh, now called Mega. And uh, I decided that it was going to become proprietary, and I didn't want it to become proprietary. I just thought it's something that ought to be shared. And uh, since there's no such thing as settled science, uh, what I was doing is collecting data. And, and I, I wanted it out there for people to, to tear down, tear it up, uh, add to. Uh, and so I went to work uh, at uh, Chapman University with uh, Bob Corrigan, set up the Experience Teacher Fellowship Program, which was federally funded. Then got an invitation from Bob Morgan at Florida State University to join that group. And at that time, I was very honored uh, because uh, we had Walter Dick, Bob Branson, um, uh, a whole host, Bob Gagne, a whole host of really superstars. And so I accepted the offer uh, and uh, moved back there. And although FSU didn't give me much support, they gave me a lot of freedom. Mm -hmm. And at that time, we were uh, developing uh, and applications for needs assessment and strategic planning. And uh, was fortunately enough to get into a lot of, uh, of uh, state contracts and very appreciative to people uh, anywhere from uh, law enforcement to vocational adult and community education uh, to support us and some graduate students. 
And it's important to some really graduate students. Uh, Ryan Watkins, who's now a full professor at George Washington University. Ingrid Gerard Lopez, who is now a full professor at uh, Wayne State University. Uh, Doug Lay, who is a full professor at Pepperdine. Uh, and they uh, they were successful in spite of me. <laughs> but I had an opportunity to work with some good students and learn from them and hope they learn something from me. Now, that's probably more than you wanted to no, know. No, in fact, that's great. In fact, I'm, I'm going to go back and, and revisit a couple of the topics here. Um, so that's... so. It was back then when you started developing MEGA. Could For our audience, could you give us a thumbnail definition of what MEGA is, what it's all about, what it's intended to do? Um, uh, please. Look, Guy, first of all, I want to thank you for doing this. Uh, you, you've become the historian of, uh, of, uh, of our field. And also, uh, let's not minimize the great contributions you've made uh, to, the, to the field. Uh, your your material on, uh, on learning and design and performance improvement are still uh, cogent. So, anyway, uh, let me tell you a little bit about how I came to Mega. Um, I was in San Diego. I was driving along uh, Interstate 8. Our son, Jack, who was mm, four at the time, uh, like uh, inquisitive kids, said, uh, ask me a question. And I said, uh, why? And uh, the... Uh, so I answered his question, and he said, responded, and he said, why? And then um, he kept asking me why, and I kept giving the answers. And around the third or fourth question, I ran out of reasons. Mm-hmm. And I said, you know, he deserved better than, well, because I say so. <laughs> and so I started a sort of a philosophical regression back into, you know, what, you know, like Marty used to say, what's it all about, Marty? What's this all about? And I kept ask, answering the question is, well, you know, at that time, everybody was into instructional design and, and workplace development. And I said, well, suppose we're successful at that. And then that led to the next uh, thing is, uh, well, then what we do is uh, individuals in small groups work better together, more successfully. And I said, oh, okay. Uh, but if we get that, what's the result of that? And I said, well, the, uh, we do it right. The organization uh, has something useful to deliver outside of itself. And then th- the most embarrassing thing of all is they, yeah, but that's where most people stop. And the question is, does it do any good outside? Does it do any good for the external client and the shared society or what Roger Addison would call world? Uh, does it do anything for them? And so that's where the idea of, uh, Mega came from. I, I didn't put a label on it till I got to, to Tallahassee. Mm-hmm. And then sitting around and talking to some of the people in statistics and engineering uh, and public administration, I came up with the um, probably uh, unpretty uh, uh, label of Mega, where the primary client and beneficiary is tomorrow's child, is society, uh, now in the future. And so I blame it all on our son, Jack. Mm-hmm who is now 49 years old, uh, a videographer for Florida State University, and sometimes I think he would deny his culpability on all this. Uh, Mega is the uh, is the idea that um, everything that we use, do, produce, and deliver uh, either has a positive impact on society or a negative. Uh, Dale Brethauer many years ago said, if you're not adding value to society, you're subtracting value. And I wish I'd said that. I didn't. Dale did, so I, I quote him on it. Mm-hmm. And uh, the, uh, by the way, Dale is one of our, I think, one of our underappreciated people in our field. I just think he's smart as hell and, and has made great contributions. And so that's the idea that, uh, you know, what's it all about, Marty? It's all about making our world measurably better for everyone in it, regardless of color, race, creed, sex, religion, uh, politics, national origin, gender preference. Uh, we're all in this place together, and uh, if we're not adding value to that, as Dale says, we're subtracting it. So that, that's that's what it's about. The next uh, uh, challenge to that is, well, you know, how do you measure that? And I got a lot of heat from uh, a lot of people say, you know, all your criteria that you use, you know, uh, uh, death rate, uh, you know, uh, incarceration, 
uh, rape, uh, these things, these things. That's all negative. What about positives? I said, damn it, that's the only way we keep score. I'd love to talk about positive things. I tell you what, you tell me how you measure the positives. Well, they got very quiet. And it turns out that I agree, I'd rather do the, the, the positive stuff. But that's the way we keep score, and that's the way uh, uh, we get a lot of our data from actual government, state, local, uh, uh, federal. And we get that. And what we can do is plot the, the gap, the need between those results and the results we want to get. Ideal. What do we want? Zero murders, zero rapes, uh, uh, zero uh, uh, lack of surviving contribution. And so that's where we got into the concept of need as a gap in results. And, uh, of course, that, that fought the conventional wisdom because everybody read Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And uh, he and I, before he died, had a conversation about this. I don't know whether you want me to go into Please. it or not. Yes. <laughs> uh, Maslow was a genuine genius. Um, and we had a conversation uh, at U.S. Industries. We were trying to get him to uh, come and join our faculty. And um, he, he was toying with it. And one day I said, you know, I don't think you have a hierarchy of needs. And he said, oh, what do I have? I said, I, think, I said, well, where do we read about you? He said, I hope you buy my books. <laughs> I said, fair enough. And uh, I said, uh, well, we read about you in chapters on motivation. And he said, yes, that's fair enough. I think you have a hierarchy of motivators. Given a gap, this is the order in which you will deal with those. And he says, I'll think about it, but I have a lot invested in this. <laughs> and, and uh, excuse me. <coughs> so, uh, the, um, uh, again, I've, I've had the honor and privilege of interacting with some really great people, and Maslow was was one of those. And and recently, I've come up with I don't know why it took me so long, guy, but uh, with with a hierarchy of, of planning uh, and a related hierarchy of needs, mm -hmm. and that's based upon uh, my development of the organizational elements, and that's what organizations uh, use, do, produce, deliver outside of themselves. An external impact and those levels starting at the societal impact I call outcomes what organizations do, can deliver I call outputs the building block results I call products the, the, how we do things I call processes and the resources I call inputs Jan my wife likes to call those ingredients and that's probably a better word and you have to have all of those they have to be linked and aligned Danny Langdon early in our literature talked about alignment and uh, I think people just shook their head and said yes, uh, but uh, I think alignment and, and integration is really important. So there's a hierarchy of planning, and you have to have all of them, but the most important is societal or mega. And given that, if needs are gaps in results, and I think they are, then uh, there's also a parallel hierarchy of needs assessments at those five levels. Oh, thank you. Thank you for that. You've mentioned a number of uh, NSPI luminaries in this. Uh, I happen to be uh, doing one of these interviews with Dale Brethauer later today. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm happy to go back and circle back with him and do a second one. This is your, you and I have done these videos now. This is our third video of this, and thank you for doing this. But let's go back. Thank you. Let's go back to the start of NSPI. Uh, back in the early 60s, 62, um, you were, uh, I think you've missed one conference since 1962, as I recall, because you had to have foot surgery. But yeah. so you're the, you've got the longest, uh, uh, you've got the longevity with the organization. And tell us a little bit about the early days of NSPI and how you became involved, because I think it's a fascinating story I'd like to capture. Well, the, uh, the behaviorists would call that, in May's behavior, obstinate progression. I keep <laughs> on going, no matter what. Um, the, uh, I was working at uh, Bolt Baranica Newman, and one day I got a call from an Air Force colonel by the name of Gabriel D. Ofeich, uh, who was about five foot three, five foot four, and dynamic. 
And he said, uh, Roger, you've uh, uh, just signed on to start a new organization called the National Society for Performance Improvement. Uh, we, uh, the charter is uh, getting signed. And oh, by the way, uh, you're going to start the New York chapter. Uh, Gabe never asked. He always told me. Mm-hmm. And, uh, uh, his background was kind of interesting because he was at the Air Force Academy and somebody came in, according to him, uh, to uh, sell him a teaching machine and he threw him out. He said, this violates everything that's sacred about instruction. And then he changed his mind. He evolved. And then he started uh, uh, this thing and he started calling in the people he thought were the, the best in the business and um, started building this field. And, and, the, and the secret sauce... The secret sauce was always research-based, evidence-based results. Mm-hmm. Uh, he and everybody else agreed that means are very important, but ends are what we want to get. And uh, and that was to me that was that was the uh, uh, ev- evolving of, of NSPI. Uh, later on, they decided, and I think rightfully so, that it. It was larger than national. They added ISBI. Uh, at the most, we could get international some Canadians, mm-hmm. and then we started started trying to get broader than that. So it was an evidence based thing. And you and I, in the earlier conversation, said we used to be there when somebody would stand up and give a presentation, and somebody would say on the other side, "Well, where the hell are your results? Where's where's the research evidence for that?" And we'd start talking about research-based evidence and no matter what level we were working at the litmus test is could you prove it with with uh, repeatable results yeah and i think we started drifting away from that maybe that's the topic for another time but i i think we've started drifting away from that yes i would agree that <laughs> seems to be missing here that was the challenge i always attributed it to the uh, late claude lineberry and his uh, colleague bob carlton it, one of them would stand up and challenge a speaker and say, where's your data? And then on the other side of the room, the other one would stand up and say, and data is plural. Um, yes. but, and so and Joe, that was helpful. And Joe Harless was, yeah. Joe Harless was in that argument too. <laughs> he would, yes, yeah. he would be. But it was helpful for me because I wasn't schooled in this. And so this is where I learned. And this is where I learned to be wary of certain practices and promotions that, you know, some speakers would do because that's what they go to conferences to do most of the time. It's not to share, it's to sell. But uh, yeah, absolutely. And Harless used to call these snake oil. Yes. Um, so that so your early days, so you served as president, you've served as a, a chapter member, you've been at all these conferences. You Are you still presenting at the conference? Uh, yes, if, if they let me. Uh, the uh, it, it turns out that there's there's probably a an evolution of uh, people who are credible. Mm-hmm. Uh, the uh, uh, some of us, uh, uh, I think, uh, when Coscarelli was president, uh, he publicly stated, uh, "All you old timers, get the hell out of here. This is a new era with new people, and we know more than you do." And sort of discounted uh, some of the few. I didn't feel old at the time, but he certainly made me feel old. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, and I think maybe that's happening again. Is that uh, Maybe uh, old people like you and me and and uh, and Dale and and Roger Addison and uh, Jim Hill and Margo. Uh, yeah. Maybe we're not current enough for them, uh, but uh, yeah, the, the beat goes on, and and I'm still trying to present, and uh, uh, not for my own ego, because as you pointed out, I got enough articles and books, uh, but try to. Uh, pass stuff on and get some feedback from some of the younger people that are going to make this field go on. Mm -hmm. Well, let's just, we've talked, we've hit on some things here that I wanted to cover. Now you've got 41 books, so we're not going to cover your 41 books, but I will list them in the blog post that's going to go along with this video. But uh, um, for our audience, thank you for our audience. What name two or three of the books that you think uh, stand out and should be, seriously looked at by people new to the profession or uh, at an intermediate stage, what would you well, recommend? Well, the fact that I have 41 books is probably uh, prima facie evidence that I couldn't get it right the first time. Uh, the uh, and, it, and it's evolved as I've learned more, you know, I've, I've updated and added mm-hmm. to it. Um, the, the, the two most recent is uh, 
an ATD book uh, that I wrote with Ingrid Gerda Lopez on uh, needs assessment. Uh, and uh, before that is the uh, an HRD press book, uh, uh, Mega Thinking and Plan, uh, uh, Manager's Pocket Guide. Um, those probably are the two best summaries. Probably mm-hmm. the best book I ever wrote, which never got any attention, was jointly published by ISPI and, and then ASTD, uh, the Identifying and Solving Problems. Uh, it was sort of a semi-cartoon book uh, where we used uh, uh, koalas and wallabies and kangaroos uh, to discuss it because I wanted to be gender neutral mm-hmm. and uh, the uh, the trouble is that ASDD never put it in their catalog and ISPI wasn't capable of promoting it and the book never went any place. I'd, I'd love to redo it so if anybody out there would, would uh, like to to have that uh, done I, I, I think that has the basis for just about everything so those those are the three that, that I think probably represent the, the most of my ignorance. Well, thank you for sharing that. Uh, that's that's important. Um, <laughs> I, I wanted, on my list of things to discuss with you, um, is this concept and, I guess, technique, double bottom line. Now, I've heard Mariano Bernadese talk about this over the years, and I'd like to talk about with you about both double bottom line learning and the work that you're doing with Mariano at the Global Network, because I think that you've been influential in getting some of these concepts and tools, if you will, into this global network. And I and I think that that also goes back to the Sonora Institute of Technology in Mexico. So maybe I'm bundling too many things together in, in one topic area, but uh, what can you share with us about all of that? Well, uh, first of all, what a pleasure it is to work with Mariano Bernardes. Uh, he's got his doctorate out of the University of Buenos Aires during a very storming time where military was taking over things, and uh, he he persevered anyway. Um, I was doing some work in uh, Buenos Aires, and Mariano asked to meet with me, and we found out that we had a lot in common, and, and from there started uh, working together. Uh, the uh, I have... Um, I've always said there's two bottom lines. Uh, one is the societal, uh, you know, what value you add or subtract from society. And the other is the conventional bottom line, which organizations report on their quarterly profit and loss sheets. Um, for a while there, the big consulting firms came up with a triple bottom line, and that was the environment. And I said, Jim, why stop at that? You know, why not? have another bottom line for human resources and another bottom. I said, the, the problem with the triple bottom line is that it's nice to sell things and consulting, but it really is a subset of the mega, the societal bottom line. And by stripping those things out, we're liable to miss the fact that these things have to integrate. They have to go together. These are not stovepipes uh, to, to make our world a better place. Uh, so I talked about the double bottom line. Uh, Mariano and I agreed on that. Uh, Mariano has probably put out one of the best um, uh, metric models for dealing with that. Uh, we've written about it in a couple of articles. I have it in the uh, the HRD book, Mega Planning, and it looks looks at the complexity of the variables. Of course, you can't catch all the variables, uh, but uh, th- this is probably the best there is uh, on. Uh, on Double, double learning, that, that's Chris Argyris's term as I understand it, and that is single uh, loop is where you uh, respond and nobody does anything about it, and double loop is where you take that feedback and do it constantly to change, which is, which is uh, critical in a, in a system approach where you're, you're doing continual improvement. Uh, you know, science and, and everything else is, is an ongoing drama. And uh, we never know, know enough to say, Eureka, we found it. We're, we're, we're still doing improvement. And as soon as we stop uh, doing continual improvement and doing inquiry, I think we're in trouble. And that goes for every field that I know of. Uh, by the way, in, in, in that area, uh, one comment, uh, Ryan Watkins and Doug Lay are doing a series of podcasts 
about science and where they're looking at uh, different aspects of science. And what they're doing is, is talking about how all the disciplines really come together. You know, you and I live in a world, and if we could say, well, it was just about instructional design, that would, that would be simple, but it wouldn't work. And they're always working in an environment, and there's things going on, and there's people doing physics and biology and, and uh, uh, brain chemistry and all of this. And these things have to go together. And they're presenting these blogs, uh, which are really kind of interesting to talk about the, the integration that's necessary. Mm -hmm. Thank you. This is uh, perhaps a nice segue uh, discussing continuous improvement and double loop learning. And I, I wanted to bring up uh, this, this group that was called the Tucson 7. And uh, I want to give a little back. Infamous, yeah, the infamous, infamous, infamous group Tucson 7. And uh, this was this started, I can't remember if it was 2002, 3 or 4, but I was either uh, becoming the president-elect of the society or I, I was becoming the president of the society. I can't recall, but Roger Addison invited me and Tim Eskew to come with him to a meeting that was occurring. And when we got to the meeting, there were seven of you. You, uh, you were there. Rumler was there. Toasty was there. Uh, Danny Langdon was there. Bob Carlton. Uh, Claude Lineberry was there. And Joe Harless wasn't because he was he had retired and wasn't coming to the conferences any longer. Yeah. But so the seven uh, and Dale Breathauer, that was the seven. Yeah. Um, and the, you, I was brought along because I was going to become the leader of the society. And this group had some complaints and I was there to listen to these complaints so that hopefully I, you know, we could do something about it to uh, address those issues that you guys were raising. Uh, the meeting uh, uh, went on, and then at the end of it, they decided, okay, let's go meet at Gary Rummer's place in Tucson, and uh, and we uh, we all got it on our calendars and agreed this was a good date and all that stuff. And then a couple of days later, I was disinvited, and Tim Eskew was disinvited, and Roger Addison was disinvited, and Roger's the one who communicated the fact that we were no longer <laughs> invited to attend, and... So this, so the seven of you met in Tucson, and as I understood it, the what because I asked about this. Okay, so what came of this, and what do you want us in leadership of the society to do? And what I had heard is that you spent a lot of time over the course of a number of meetings, um, discussing. Uh, I'm going to wait till the ring is done. Yeah, Jan said she was going to get the phones. All right. Okay, so what I heard was that you guys met and spent most of your time catching each other up to what you did, how you did it, explaining your concepts, your models, your methods, etc., and spent a lot of time sharing with that. And at one time talked about uh, perhaps breaking away and starting a new society because you didn't feel that uh, ISPI was meeting your needs in that. Now, so that's a long preface to... Uh, asking you to share with us, you know, what were the issues, as you recall them, that the Tucson 7 was discussing? And if you can recall, you know, what do they want to be done to address those needs? Uh, so what can you share with us about that? Well, my, I have no responsibility on who got disinvited or invited. All of a sudden, I found out I was included, and I was happy enough. I wondered why, because um, I was pretty much out of the mainstream, and uh, we did. It, we, we talked. Uh, Don Toasty talked endlessly about his, uh, his accomplishments, which, which were substantial. Uh, the, uh, Danny talked about alignment, which was in, important. Um, the, uh, uh, we, we got into some interesting things. Uh, I guess we were meeting because we thought that ISBI had drifted away away from its evidence-based um, orientation. And we started getting people who uh, were helping put together the, the conferences. And sexy titles were, were in, and substance seemed to be out. And we enjoyed what you were talking about earlier, that challenge of, well, damn it, prove it. 
and that, which, which is very important, you know. And uh, the uh, so we we talked about that. Uh, I and I guess a couple of others didn't want to break away from ISPI. Uh, we thought that uh, uh, we could try to help them, and maybe by uh, being being a, a constant force uh, to try to move it back towards the evidence based results would probably be better. Um, I don't I don't know how. I don't think that's been very successful, and that's one of my problems. But the the thing that uh, let me share you something that the Butch Claude Lineberry said to me, I guess in maybe the third meeting, and we were all talking about you know somebody says what's all this BS about Mega Roger and so forth, and Butch said Claude said lean back and he said Roger, you're the only one here who gives a damn about my son. He said. I give a damn about my son and his future. And that's what you're talking about. And, and guy, I felt vindicated. <laughs> uh, uh, and, but the th- good thing is we could talk about this kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. And uh, there wasn't particularly any forums. Uh, one time uh, at ISBI, I decided together with Bob Morgan, who was my boss at the time, to have a session on our greatest failures. And they gave us a room, uh, which was just one size above a broom closet. Mm-hmm. And we started talking, and all of a sudden, the overflow, and then we moved to another room, and then we moved to another room. Excuse me. <coughs> and we talked about things that we did that went wrong. We can learn from negative instances. And it was a huge success, so ISBI decided never to schedule it again. Well, I... Regarding the the challenges to get back to evidence-based practices, you know, when I started in 1979, it was research-based practices, or research-based was the the term, the phrase, and then that evolved to become evidence-based practices, but in the 2012 conference, the 50th anniversary conference of the society, Dick Clark, Richard E. Clark, in his keynote address, laid down the gauntlet. He challenged the society to get back to evidence-based practices and to uh, differentiate the society from all the other affinity groups that are out there by focusing on evidence-based practice. And um, I, I, in talking with him and doing one of these video interviews with him a, a couple of months ago, uh, he feels that the, 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 that that call, that clarion call was not, uh, was ignored. And it's just, so I think that, you know, we're opportunity rich in a sense <laughs> to put a positive spin on it. Yeah. Um, we, I would like to see, you would like to see many of what I would call the old guard and the, the people in the middle um, uh, remember the the organization for being about measured results and at various levels at the uh, worker level, uh, the individual level, the, the, the process level or the work level, the workplace or organizational level and at the world level, level uh, what you refer to as mega um, and the societal impact. And um, Tom, I, I wish Tom, we could get Tom, to that. Tom, Tom Gilbert also introduced the concept of worthy results. Yes, right. And and I think the idea of worthy results, I don't think he ever got to mega, but I think, you know, if he had stuck around, we would have gotten there with him. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, the, you know, I, I, I don't know. I, 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 I'm sad about ISPI. I still think it's retrievable. Uh, but um, the, the, for some reason, they moved away from, from this core. And I don't know is it because the, the new uh, uh, master's and doctoral programs aren't talking about it? I think Boise State is, mm-hmm. uh, and I think some others are, but, but we're, we're talking about softer things. Not that the softer things are not, are not useful, but you have to combine hard data and soft data. You have to do that crosswalk because perceptions for people are reality. Uh, on the other hand, uh, what happens to them is also reality. So we have to have both of those. And I think we've been moved towards the softer 
side. I think the other problem that we had is we tried to emulate ASTD, uh, ATD, uh, and and they're a different different organization with a different target population. Uh, the um, and and God bless them, them and Sherm are, are are important players, but I think we have a different mix, and that that's the one that you brought up very early. You know, where's your data for that? And, and really science and research and evidence uh, has to come back into play. Uh, and I think that's what we have to offer. So if you were king of ISPI or the ISPI czar, what would you put in place? What specific kinds of tangible mechanisms and or policies and practices would you do to affect the society for uh, its betterment. And am, am I really king without limitations? Well, yes, please. Okay. Be, be as ideal, okay. well, you know, but okay. we do well, have we, gravity, but these are, so other than that. Right. Uh, well, uh, first of all, I would get rid of ISPIs uh, having the board put up a slate. Uh, I think that's like the divine right of kings and it, it, it doesn't allow any a real refreshment to happen. Uh, the other thing is that I would install immediately as president either Ingrid Gerard Lopez or Mariano Bernardes, uh, and um, uh, get a board around them that uh, really is diverse, but also uh, has an emphasis on uh, research results and evidence base, uh, and then help them reshape uh, the culture and the direction of, of, of the, the society. Uh, in the meantime, I think there's some other things that are happening uh, which are important. I, I think there's probably three kinds of, of organizations that are, that are making really a great contribution. Uh, one is the um, San Francisco Boise State Chapter of ISPI, who seems to be very interested in, in bringing um, teachable moments to their membership. Uh, and, I, and I think that's a, a very important uh, um, organization. Uh, the other is ISBI -E EMEA, uh, the leadership of Carol Panza and, and others uh, who got the an international focus on it and interesting in their conferences, which are very good. Uh, part of it is to take on a real-life uh, situation with a real life organization and get people to work on it and come up with some recommendations and conclusions. Well, you know, uh, in the general presentation. And the other thing is Mary, what Mariano has done, uh, the first great personal sacrifice, both financial and personal, uh, to start the Performance Improvement uh, Institute. Uh, he shares his time between Chicago and Buenos Aires. Um, the, uh, he uh, uh, has, with some of my help and some of my hindrance, applied mega in places like, uh, um, well, the master's and doctoral program we started at the Sonora Institute of Technology with the Gonzalo Rodriguez Villanueva. He was the, the rector, the head of it, and he was the one who invited all of this. And he's sort of an unsung hero. Uh, he's an economist by trade and also a very smart guy. Uh, and allowed us to do that, and uh, got uh, uh, programs and projects going that uh, are continuing to this day, and actually making money for uh, uh, ITSA. Uh, we uh, uh, then started uh, working at uh, uh, Panama. The primary client, as you mentioned earlier, was the president of Panama and the Minister of Tourism. And the Minister of Tourism, for, for you know all his weaknesses and strength, uh, called what we were doing city doctors. Because our challenge was to uh, use the mega planning model to uh, do the plan for uh, the transformation of the city of Colón. Colón was the second largest city. Uh, one of the entrances on the Panama Canal. Uh, it was a disaster. Forty-two percent of the buildings were uh, condemned. Uh, there were six major gangs and hundreds of minor gangs. One was all female gang, uh, and. Um, the, uh, so we started working on it and gave them a plan and, 
it was going well. We had the support, interesting, of the business community and the citizens. And then, you know, had a change in presidency. And, you know, when you change presidency, you have to bring in your whole agenda. Excuse me. <coughs> uh, then uh, I had worked with Mariano and uh, uh, with uh, an energy company in, in Argentina. And Mariano actually uh, uh, tracked the results of what happens when you have mega planning and when you take it away. Uh, then uh, Mariano started working with... Uh, uh, Barcelona, Spain, uh, in, in applying uh, this. Uh, then I've uh, been fortunate enough to be asked uh, by the Novel Cities program in Kansas City, who uh, invited me to talk to them about needs assessment. And they said, oh, we're really doing mega. And I said, yeah, you really are. And so we have lots of, of laboratories. Uh, they're more than laboratories because they involve the lives uh, of, of real people. So you don't want to mess with that casually. Mm -hmm. and philosophy and, and doctrine takes a second place to people's survival, self-sufficiency, and quality of life. And Mariano has been key in all of these. And uh, the uh, uh, he doesn't like me to tell him this. I said, you know, you really ought to be a professor. You're really a scholar. He is because he does great research and a lot of thinking about things. Uh, but he didn't doesn't think that, uh, doesn't have much respect for universities. Uh, uh, but, uh, so those are the three key things. And, and I would really encourage people to, to attend ISPI EMEA, uh, to become members at uh, uh, San Francisco, Santa Barbara, uh, uh, Boise State, and uh, become a member of uh, PII and support that. Because while, to me, while we're trying to recover ISPI, it's it's like somebody who is uh, um, going off on uh, and had to have therapy. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, while they're they're drifting, uh, these are the other things that are building the field, and I, I'd love to see them to get together and not be competitors, but to have synergy and synthesis. Yes, I agree. Thank you for uh, mentioning all of them. Because these are examples, positive examples of what ISPI may uh, adopt and uh, perhaps adapt some of the things that they're doing. But uh, we need to let them continue to, to uh, lead by example um, for the rest of us to begin to emulate. Good point. Um, and uh, th thank you for sharing that about the City Doctors Program and Mariano. And uh, next time you talk to Mariano, you can put a little bug in his ear about when will he sit down with me and do one of these videos because we had it on a calendar at one point and then it went off the calendar and we haven't uh, rescheduled. And I would certainly like to include him in this uh, series. Good. I think he's an important, important player. Yes. Um, to kind of bring this interview to a close, um, I, uh, I, for, I, I forewarned you that uh, this, this final question was coming. So what I'm, what I'm looking for is what words of wisdom would you have for people who are entering the field? What guidance can you provide them, much as you might have done with uh, students in the past? Oh, boy, that, that, that's interesting uh, well, go forth and multiply. Uh, one of the things is, is take the evidence-based, research-based, holistic concepts, not just little pieces alone, uh, but do the integration and go forth and generate useful examples of, of research and application that work and, and work with others to get that done as well. Uh, my advice is... Um, one of our former master students, uh, Don Trinner in the Coast Guard, um, who, who won our Outstanding Master Student Award twice at Florida State, uh, the, uh, uh, the faculty meeting somebody objected to the, the second time. And I said, well, what is this, equal distribution? Or are we recognizing real talent? And, and Don Trinner was one of those. And uh, thankfully, he served for a while as executive director of ISPI and helped uh, steer it right. Uh, Don gave some advice, which I think is uh, uh, 
you mind if I use his advice? In Please, my mind? Go, go ahead. He said, don't go native. He said, you go out there in the field and everybody's talking about exclusive workplace development or constructivism or uh, 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 big data. And, and they said, uh, don't go native. Keep the integrity of what you learned and what you know how to do and what you will continually evolve to be. And I think that's another important piece of advice is uh, uh, you're too young to remember, but there was a big scandal in the United States Senate where uh, one woman who was being oppressed said, well, to get along, you got to go along. And a lot of people just sort of yield to the, the culture to think that uh, they have to, to do it the way everybody else is doing. And by the way, if you do that, you don't have any exceptional value. If you're like everybody else, um, you know, uh, you're a replaceable part. If you're the person who is pushing the frontier on the basis of evidence, you will emerge and go further. And so that's, that's my humble advice. I wish I had taken it when I was younger. <laughs> well, Roger... Thank you so much for agreeing to do this video with me. Thank you for all that you do for the profession. And thank you for all that you have done, which is uh, certainly uh, um, significant. Uh, have a great day. And please give my regards to your lovely wife, Jan. I will. And, thank, and thanks for you doing what you're doing. I appreciate it. You're welcome. Have a good day. Bye. Have a good day. Bye-bye.